there's so many people that are listening to this that are clients of ours that are the most sophisticated residential real estate agents on the planet. They know their market, they know the trends, they know the data, like they are just, they're the true professionals. And many of them, when you start talking about real estate investing, they go like they just, so here's the thing. Entrepreneurs, leaders, salespeople. We all wanna create consistent, repeatable, and scalable ways to grow our business and our income. And we wanna do it better, faster, and more seamlessly. Why? So we can actually enjoy our lives, take vacations, and spend the quality time that we want with the people that we love. How do we do all this without spending a fortune or running ourselves ragged? That's the big question. And this show is dedicated to the answer. All right, so uh, for all my listeners out there today, I've got Andy Day Carter here, and Andy is a real estate investor. He's uh, an author, right? Been on multiple television shows, and you know, like myself, has a very interesting past that brought him to this point, which we'll get into. So I want to first just say, Andy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Tom. Appreciate yeah, it, brother. Yeah, appreciate it, man. So, Andy, for the people that don't know your background, um, give them just a little backstory, and then let's get into the book and let's get into you know buying real estate. Absolutely. So, here's the quick version. I was uh, four years old and my parents got divorced. We moved back to Long Beach, very, very poor. I have a little brother raised by a single mom. And from a pretty young age, it was very clear to me that I was gonna have to kind of be the man of the house. So I had to grow up really fast, which is great if you wanna be where I'm at now, but it's hard when you're a kid. So there was some stuff that I missed out on, but some stuff cemented who I am today and I would never change a thing. And I got to help my mom, my brother and everything else. I started working when I was 12 because we moved over to the west side of Long Beach. And then I went to Los Al, which is right next to Seal Beach. And there was a bunch of rich kids there. Yeah. And the rich kids got whatever they wanted. Yeah. So new cars, new cars, all that stuff. Yeah. I drove into the parking lot um, in the high school and was blown away. But when I was 12, we went to the surf shop. There was this new wetsuit. And two of my buddies, they said, oh, this is great. Their parents came back and they bought them. And I was like devastated. That was even an option for me. It was like 480 bucks, which is like thousands back then. Yeah. 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 So I went to all the businesses and all through the area and I was trying to see if I could work and nobody would hire me because I was 12. I was a kid. A silk screening place said, you can come here and clean these screens for 20 bucks every day after school. I was done. Done. I did that. I went to the surf shop every day, gave the guy 20 bucks and I left there after a few months with this wetsuit and I cried the whole way home. It changed my life forever. And then I worked at, when I was 14, I worked at El Pollo Loco because my friend's dad owned it. El Pollo Loco. And then I started- the California people know that song. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And then I started to work at Baskin Robbins scooping ice cream. Yeah. And I'm like, I wanna learn the restaurant business. So at 17, I went to a place called Cerevelo's. It's a huge sports bar in Long Beach. And I went there to go be a busboy. And from the busboy, I was there with all these college kids and the college kids were all there trying to become barbacks and bartenders. Well, they thought I was 21. So I got the job. They put me behind the bar. They started training me as a bartender when I was a junior in high school. So I was making like 300 bucks. It was the best thing ever. And I'm like, this is great. From there, I went, I was going to be a fireman basically my whole entire life. was in school to do that. Went to this amazing restaurant, started waiting tables there and fell in love with wine. My life changed forever. I wanted to become one of the youngest wine sommeliers in the country. At 21, that fire was 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 lit. I passed the test, became a huge wine nerd, and basically traveled all over the place, worked for some big companies, put on a ton of weight, got very unhealthy, couldn't stand corporate America. I liked working for myself, owning my own companies, and hit pause on my life. And decided right then, I'm gonna get healthy. I'm gonna become an athlete again, like I was. Got as clear as I've ever been went all in on real estate because it was a friend of mine said, why don't you try real estate? You're a really smart guy. You built sales teams and companies. Just go do that. And then you can still have this amazing lifestyle you've created. It's like, all right, I'll give it a shot. So what year was this? That was 2010, no, 2008. 2008. 2008. I was so running I love, into I love this. This is so great. Like, hey, the market is completely... You should go into real estate. No. Every, well, he was an investor. Yeah. Everybody's running out. I went and took the class at like a first team office. There was yep. two people in the whole class. Yeah. When the guy was telling me, 
12 months earlier, there was 400 people yes. in that same yeah. thing. Yeah. So for me, I was just like, well, I, I there, like there was a call and I want to do a deep meditation. Like mm -hmm. I got the answers I was looking for. But I want to be clear. You weren't looking to go into residential real estate. You were going in as an investor. As an investor. So I'm there at first team and they're telling me all this stuff about open houses. And I'm like, geo farming and like, call nope, your clients. Don't, I don't, and, I don't yeah. care. I yeah. would do all of my, all of my contracts. I would write as cash offers. So they're like, yeah. you're just like, it wasn't going the fast way. It's, yeah. it's who I wanted to speak to. Yeah. And I was setting that mindset early. I'm going to be an investor within my first year in real estate. So how many, how many transactions from an investment standpoint did you do year one? 86. Okay. So what, and what does that mean? Like we, we buy fixing and flipping. What was the model you were following? We're buying and holding. We did a lot of the flipping part. So for me, there was a company that I went to go work for for free because I wanted a desk. I wanted to be in there. It was a small firm. Mm -hmm. My friend owned it. He was brilliant. And I wanted to, to learn from him. He had almost 16 years in the game, was very successful. Fixing and flipping or just real estate? Fixing and flipping okay. and real estate and doing developments and everything. Got it. I wanted to fast track everything. Mm -hmm. So I didn't there know There seems that to be a pattern here, Andy. <laughs> there is, man, I'm telling you, it's crazy. <laughs> so for me, I wanted to learn as fast as humanly possible. So I'm like, I'm gonna go work there for free. They put a desk by the door. I was barely even in yeah, the office, yeah. but I learned and I listened within, 60 days, I was crushing the phones. I was great on the phones. I was great at building relationships with other brokers and other agents. Mm -hmm. So we went from doing 20 to 30 deals every month, all the way at the auction in LA yeah. and all this stuff, yeah. to now doing REOs and short sales and crazy off-market deals through my relationships. Yes, I went from making zero to 2,500, to 5,000, to 10,000, to then 50,000 a month within my first six months. And then we started doing tons of deals. So we're buying these things, we're buying tons of stuff, and it just lit this fire, I can't even explain. Oh yeah, now that was a moment in time, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of people making money doing that, and the market's mm -hmm. different today. Now we've got iBuyers, and we've got institutional money coming in. Absolutely. So what was your transition? Because you, you, you went in, fixing and flipping, and then access to the REOs and the short sales, and doing more of that. Mm -hmm. Did you transition away from that or do you still have the fix and flip business today? We do 20, maybe 30 a year, yeah. but we were doing almost 200. And that's more the market, if, yeah, right? Just was, the, it, was, it was all predicated on the market. And we talked about a little bit off camera. We weren't smart enough yet as real estate investors and developers because we were just fix and flippers. Yeah. We wanted to learn how to build. Yeah. So we saw these trends in the market that we could buy these multifamily buildings for pretty cheap. Uh, this was, you know, 2011, 12, which mm -hmm. they were incredible prices yep. till then. And we started buying flat pieces of land. We found this little thing called a small lot ordinance and we figured out we can buy the dirt, we could subdivide it into a small lot ordinance, then we can sell it to one of the big developers, fully entitled. It's gonna cost us a couple hundred grand to get it entitled. We don't hammer a nail and we make and, a ton of money. I was saying, you make the same money. Same and, amount. And it's it's still hard work. It's very hard. Going to the city, like getting it, getting things entitled. So we wanna, you know. Working with architects. Everything we're talking about is not easy. This is all hard, smart, relationship-based, grind, follow-up work, yes? 100%. Yeah. Everybody that's out there now that's thinking about taking some wholesale course and you're yeah. gonna make 200 grand off of somebody else's money this year, it's all horseshit. Yeah. So for me. Thank you for saying that. It's the work. That is basically YouTube Ugh. for days right now. When those people fall into my YouTube feed, I'm like, delete, delete. Like, how do I get you out of oh, here? Yeah, yeah. Because they're the people that come learn some stuff from me and then go think they can teach it. You yeah. have not closed one of these deals. Yeah. You don't know. I get deals all month long because of my 10 year relationship with these people. What was the point when you were young where you knew you were maybe a little bit different than maybe your siblings or maybe certain people in your family because you are a very competitive person like yes. I am. Yes, um, I always reflect on uh, two things. I was actually talking to my biological mom and I have uh, many, many people I refer to as mom in my life. But my biological mom, uh, when my dad called her, I was sitting on the, their bed and my mom answered the phone and she said, hung up and turned to me and said, your father's leaving us. And my older brother broke down in tears. And, and it was in that moment that I became a leader. Mm. It's in that moment, I became a man because it was suddenly like, okay, well, I have two younger siblings I need to take care of. My older brother's crying in the corner. My mom is distraught. So I'm responsible now for food, for cooking, for cleaning, for whatever it was. And I just, in that moment, I stepped you into decided. that. Yeah, like I just knew like this is, this is my calling, right? This is what I have to do. It, it's, you know, like th that's not a new story, but that's when you, when you see that kid that says, 
my parents are in trouble or my siblings are in trouble or my friend's in trouble. Mm -hmm. Some people lean into that and mm -hmm. some people run from it. I just leaned in. Uh, the second thing that I knew uh, when I knew like as a kid that I was gonna be, I was definitely different from everybody else is I was the guy <laughs> that too. could convince the entire high school, and I went to five of them, so I had a lot of experience in this, mm -hmm. uh, to basically leave school and go to somebody else's house and throw a major party. Yes. And I dominated that, like for the longest time. And it, you know, like never at my house, heaven forbid, right? I would do not. that to my mom and my, uh, right. my sibs. Um, but I was that guy that could literally just, you know, we're talking like pre Snapchat, pre texting, pre email. Yeah. You know, there was no flyers. Call. No, like I would just, I would literally sneak out of class and just walk from like class to class and just Here's signals and come on, we're going like bam. <laughs> at, at the lunch break, no one came back. It was just super fun. This sounds very familiar. And I'm sure you guys have heard this over and over again from me. It's very similar because it happened when I was four. My yeah. parents got divorced. Yep. We were living in San Diego. We back to Long Beach. Yeah. And my mom was distraught. Yeah. She was she was crushed. Yeah. And I knew right then I had to take care of my little brother. Yep. I had to be the support system for her. I was four. Like yes. I have a five year old and a three year old now. I couldn't imagine putting that on them. I know. I know. But like that was my path. Yeah. Same thing with me in high school. I would throw these massive parties and not go to like the prom or the dance, but they would come back to my house with the yes. kegs. I'd charge $3 at the door and For I'd make sure. like a G yeah. and it was the greatest thing ever. Yeah. I've always been that way. Yeah. And I've always been that like, everybody's gonna come with me. For for me and my friends, it was, we're gonna leave and go surf and not come back. Yeah. So that's, it's 100%, same, same, same path, same path. So you decided at a very young age mm -hmm. that you were gonna go all in with your family mm -hmm. and all in with you know, your mom and just kind of figure it out, right? Yeah. So that part is really, really important and you hit it perfectly. Some people run from it mm -hmm. and some people freeze in just fear and some people accept yeah. that that's their path. Yeah. And it happens to me over and over again as I reinvent myself, as I go into different careers and you have to have that either I'm going all in or I'm not. Yeah. I mean, it's- Why do you, why do you think most people run and hide from it? I think it's other people's fears that they've adopted and I think they feel like it's theirs, but they have way more power and control than they give themselves credit for. Mm -hmm. I think it starts very young. I've done a lot of research on the psychology of zero to seven years old and mm -hmm. what happens to you in that space. And it really affirms a lot of stuff that leads into adulthood, which is why they hire people like us to maybe help work them through some of those things yep. in business. Because yep. those locks, are really, really detrimental to growth in business. Have you read uh, Dr. Carol Dweck's book, The Growth Mindset? No, but I've heard about it. Okay, I, you need to read, I'll give you a copy today. Like, I would love to. Digest it. It's, you know, for the people that are listening, uh, Dr. Carol Dweck, the book is called Mindset, which immediately when you think of that, you think, uh, you know, pop psychology, you think motivation, you think, mm -hmm. you know, personal personal development. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's a clinical psychologist who, who did this sort of thesis work on Kids at you know four years old and under have an experience in their life mm -hmm. that basically shape how they view the world, right? And, and the way she 100%. describes it is you're either in what's called a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. A fixed mindset, you you freeze in in you know when there's something new delivered or some new piece of information that you don't understand. You know when you're take the classic example of a kid in school, you're you're sitting in the back of the class, never raising your hand, not being engaged. Right, because either you're afraid to make a mistake, you're afraid of rejection, you're afraid of saying the wrong thing, and then you wake up and you're 55 and you're operating the same exact way. 100%. Right, fixed mindset. Now it's context specific. You could right. be a growth mindset with working out and a fixed mindset with your work performance. Right, so mm -hmm. right, so you know we see it. So I would just recommend for all the people listening this. Um, Tom Billu actually turned me on to it first. Tom's awesome. Love that yeah. guy. Yeah, you know and and. Uh, like you, I'd heard about the book, mm -hmm. but when, when he and I were chatting, I mean, he just, he obsessed over how, how you can. And what's funny is like, I got it for all my coaches and I have like 170 coaches. And <laughs> so I'd ask them all like, what'd you guys think of the book? They're like, oh my God, it's totally amazing. And like, I could tell they only got through the first half. Of course. Right. Cause in the second half of the book, that's where she basically reveals like, now here are the strategies to identify when you're in a fixed mindset and then what to do about it. Here's right? the they, work. Yeah. The, the work. The exactly. actual work. Exactly. That like, divides the room. Nine yeah. times out of 10. Yeah. Who's all fired up and motivated <clears throat> and who's willing to actually yeah. put pen to paper yeah. and then go internal. To do what it takes to actually alter, it, it goes back to the same thing. It's like your, it's your identity, right? Mm -hmm. Your identity is how you believe in what you think about yourself and about the world. All that shapes your beliefs, right? Your mm -hmm. values of how, you, how you're gonna operate and then ultimately your behaviors, right? So everybody, they, they want to get better, 
but their identity doesn't allow them to get better. So until you so alter true. your identity, you don't alter your beliefs and your behaviors. Right. Now, he's saying you alter your identity, yeah. not fake it till you make it. No, that's <laughs> bullshit. It's 100% yeah. bullshit. Yeah, Very I mean, now I, like I did affirmations as a kid. I'm in the process of attracting $100,000 a month and I, you know, I was making like $4 a day, right? It's like totally. I was doing that stuff. Right. But everybody's like, oh, well, affirmations are BS. Like, no, affirmations are really like There's... significantly better than like CNN or oh, you know any, anything else so you could watch true. on the news. But without the work, they're bullshit. You gotta do the work and affirm, do the work and affirm. That's how you change your identity. That's what I did when I literally stopped working to become healthy. Yeah, I exactly. wanted to identify as yeah. a triathlete before I'd even done yes. a race. Yeah. So I trained like I was professional in my brain, mm -hmm. had no clue what I was doing. Yeah. yeah. But my mindset started to put me on this path yeah. of I'm going to do this until I get great at it. Yeah. And I do that with everything. So interesting you bring that up because the fastest way to change your identity is through working out, diet, exercise, right? And you look around the world. I mean, you know, we are an obese society. It's yep. disgusting at best. And and look, you know, the, the food propagates it, the government propagates it. The, the, the world basically is just said, it's just easier to give you fast, really inexpensive, bad for you food, mm -hmm. right? And keep making that choice. So it can control you. Because, it, well, it make, it's great for the insurance business. Mm -hmm. It's great for, you know, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, everyway. Like we can get into the politics of it all. Yeah. Um, but I would just tell you that uh, if you want to change your identity, start doing 10 push ups every hour on the hour. You mm -hmm. want to, you want to like watch the football game? That's great. But every commercial break, don't fast forward through. Instead, like do sit ups, do push ups, Move. do something. My wife is um, working with eight women right now, uh, all in real estate. She launched like uh, some health and vitality products, which oh, was cool. the inspiration of getting breast cancer, mm. right? Like it took breast cancer for her to finally get off her ass and Go do up. what, you know, do what she wanted to do. Um, so, breast cancer for her was a, actually a wonderful gift. Um, but she has these eight women and she's working them right now. And, and the, the women that were the most resistant, all these women are 50, 60, 70, 80, a hundred pounds overweight. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, my wife is just talking to them every week, counseling them, pushing them, encouraging them, mm -hmm. getting them to follow a better food program, getting them to work out. And I'm not, I can't say the woman's name, but she came to me this morning after like I worked out and did my gratitudes and made my gratitude call and all my normal, you know, mm -hmm. stuff in the morning. And she's like, hey, before you go, I gotta tell you what's going on with this gal. So this is a woman that is from a, like her, her parents are obese, her kid is obese, her husband's obese, everyone, like everyone that is normal for her is obese. And when she said, I'm going to start working out and eating healthy, literally her family members were like, if you do that kind of stuff, you're gonna die. Mm -hmm. Like you're gonna die. Like, mm -hmm. like imagine that fixed mindset, right? I get it, man. She's lost like 37 pounds, yes. which, which uh, the way my wife is describing it both, it, you know, it's showing up in her business, it's showing up in her relationship, it's showing up with the way she's with her kids. She's like, worth. I can, I can go in the grocery store and I don't have to lean on the basket anymore to go around. Like, do you get how significant that Those is? Those little wins oh. are the most powerful thing yeah. in your health, in yeah. your business, in your relationships. Yeah. And it all came from deciding, I'm not going to adopt yes. all my family's fears. Bingo. I say the same thing with social media, marketing and branding and personal branding. Yeah. Your friends will unfollow you. Yeah. You're, everybody around you will think you're nuts because it happened to me, it happens sure. to most people. For sure. But I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. And usually when that's happening, I'm going in the right direction. Yeah. So, and it's so, it's so powerful because what that does is now she can be the example to her kids. Now she go. can lead by example to her, everybody around her. Yes. And yeah. those success stories, I always get goosebumps because yeah. I live for this stuff. Yeah, I think it's the both. best. Yeah, you and me both. My favorite thing on earth mm -hmm. is to help people see their true potential yeah. in stuff that I see in them way before they do because yeah. it's happened to me my whole life. Yeah. There's people that have been close to me. It's like, Andy, come here. Like, yeah, yeah. This is what we've seen in like, where? Yeah. Where is that in yeah, me? Yeah, I don't yeah. see it. Yeah. But that's why I love mentors. Is they stay, lead? Hey, stay humble, man. Uh, right? Humble as whole, hell. Right? That's the whole thing. Like, they see it in you. We just do the work. Thank you. Like, they lift us up, like, as every great me coach and mentor does. But, man, you just got to do the work. It's You're the only one that's going to do it. Everybody's yeah. going to fire you up. Yep. But when everybody's gone and it's just you and yourself yep. and your mind, that's when the real work yeah. shows up yep. and that's when the real work happens. Every morning, I'm sure it's very similar to yours. Yep. It's the first thing I do is I do a 10 minute meditation. I've been doing yeah. it for 10 years. It's yeah. super important to me. Yep. And then I sit in gratitude for five minutes, which is new from the past two years. Yep. It creates this space in my day I can't even explain. Yeah. And then I work out. Yeah. 
doesn't matter what it is. Sometimes it's like the bike. Sometimes it's whatever, lifting, yeah. yoga, whatever yeah. I'm doing. I'm yeah. moving my body physically. Yeah. Then break, my, break a sweat. Break a sweat. Yeah. Then my two little monkeys wake up, three and five. They're my yeah. whole world. Yeah. I play with them. My wife's still sleeping. God bless her. She sleeps in. Yeah. She's a spicy Italian. I heard that you yes, were married to an Italian. Yes, yes. So love, love that. But she likes to sleep. So that's yeah. cool. Yeah. And then the nanny shows up and we have like family time. And then she gets up. I get the, I get the house mm-hmm. dialed in before I even think about business. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally. All, I'm all about that. It's like it's a little OCD, like with the well, house. I'm a thing. little OCD. Yeah, too. you and me both. Like you know, my wife's like, you walk inside my, you know, like in our closet. And it's like her clothes totally. versus my clothes. Now, th- fortunately, we have like her closet and yes, my closet. We do otherwise, too. you know, I would go insane. And we did. There's been times I've walked into our bedroom and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And I'll end up yeah. <laughs> walk out because yeah. I literally have that. Room. Yeah. Everything is where it's yeah. supposed to be. Yeah. I have the same money clip since I was 21 years old. Like, yeah. oh, lose stuff, clip, put it in the same place. Yeah. yeah simple, yeah. simple stuff. Yeah. But for me, it's that it's creating my day on my terms, mm-hmm. which a lot of people talk about. And, you know, I was with, um, I was with Ed Milet probably three, four weeks ago. Yeah. Great guy. And again, very humble and down to earth. And he's like, you and I are really similar. I'm like, I think you're a great guy. Like, we just tried to just to, just to talk. He's a great human being. Yeah. And those are the kind of people that I want on this show. It's the people that yes. are humble, people that yeah. are adding value, yeah. people that are trying to help. Yeah. And not just like, I'm here to make a buck. You can yeah. tell instantly yeah. someone that's in it for the cash. Yeah. yeah and yeah. it's all over the internet. Yeah. So I'm trying to they help have, people they, like yourself. They have, they have to do videos Man. saying it's not all about the cash. <laughs> It's so, it's just, it, just saying, I've seen a few of those. What's happened in 2018 is like the year of the online coach. Yeah. And then you have somebody like yourself that's literally invested your entire life's work into yeah. this. Yeah. And the difference. Yeah. I mean, it's just night and day. There's yeah. people that literally go to one of your seminars, get fired up, gets, gets all of the IP of your whole world. Yeah. And then they go to YouTube and try to like, we're going to teach you how to get more listings. And I'm like, you just word yeah. for word yeah. clipped top. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, look at, I mean, I don't know about you, but I actually appreciate it. I do stuff. too. I, it's flattering. I say congratulations. Keep up the good work. The, the world needs a lot of flavors. True. Right? Like, so, you know, like I've had this conversation with many of my contemporaries. Like it's, you know, we're all, we're all flavor, right? Mm-hmm. So yep. some people like orange, some people like blue, some people like vanilla, mm-hmm. some people like chocolate, like whatever. Right. 100%. So, yeah. But I'm with you. It is, it, I wouldn't even say it's 2018. I mean, I've been doing this now for, uh, 30 years and which is weird because I'm 48 years old. Like, it, it's, like yeah, it's, it's crazy, all, right? It's literally all I've ever done. Right. Um, do you watch or do you follow uh, The Rock? Oh, yeah. Right, DJ. Mm-hmm. So yeah. uh, he did something recently that was really interesting. He said he talked about the greatest thing he never achieved. Did mm-hmm. you see that clip? Mm-mm. And it's super interesting because it really helped frame uh, something in my own world. But I just, you know, his thing mm-hmm. was all he ever wanted to do was be a professional football player, right? Mm. So train, 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 eat, 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 work out, work out, play, 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 all the way up until the Canadian Football League. And at 21, he plays in his first game ever. He's he's arrived, now it's the Canadian, it's not the NFL. Oh, I've seen this, right? I've seen this, yeah. And then he gets cut. Mm-hmm. And he said, it was the greatest thing I never achieved mm-hmm. because had I gone down that path, I would have never done, he wouldn't be where he is today. Not in a way. Right, which is just a, just a fabulous, so like I look at those people and say, Man, go for it. It may be the greatest thing you never achieved and it may be the greatest thing you ever did. There's these little gems yeah. in everything we do and yeah. every experience we have. That's the beauty of this unbelievable path run. It's yeah. fun, it's exciting. Yeah. And there was um, there was a post you did maybe two or three days ago. Mm-hmm. It was on Instagram and you, you were responding to somebody's question. Yeah. And it was something to the effect of, it was this long post, here's what you should do, you should do that, da, da, da. And then you closed with, and then work your face off for 10 years straight. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's I, real. I think that was the guy uh, who said, like, how do I become oh, a professional speaker? Yes, and I was like, right. man, well, first of all, like, <laughs> grab a grab a phone, hit Facebook Live and go. And roll. Right. But but I think, you know, sitting here, you know, sitting here now again, like it's it's almost weird to say three decades in. Um, but people so grossly overestimate what they can accomplish in three months, a month, a oh, day, man. a week, 100%. a year. And and I'm all about like, a, you know, every every five to seven years, I rewrite a 20 year plan, right? Cause I'm all about like mm-hmm. legacy, like my family, like the, the vision of, you know, the the home that we're gonna have and seeing, I can see it like it's so clear in my head, like my, my son throwing my grandchild in the air, like that vision is so tight in my head that 
people just like, I'm all about the long game. Now I'm enjoying every minute along the way. Of course. But when you have that longer term perspective in business and in life, right? In business and in life, um, when you have that longer term perspective, when the world becomes a shit burrito, you don't take it personally, nope. right? Because it's all part of the journey, right? But when you're living in the moment and the world goes sideways, you're screwed. You have nothing to hold on to. Bingo. You're going to go down the toilet just like yep. everybody else. Yeah. And there's all this doom and gloom about the real estate market and all this stuff and everybody. I'm like, settle down. One, the greatest opportunities to ever come to real estate yes. are in this space. Yes. And exactly what's going on right now. And, and all the studies actually show the 200 greatest economists in real estate are all saying 2021 is when the next quote unquote recession is going to have. Right. And when you study the last seven recessions, only one had an impact on the real estate economy. Right. Which was the 2008 one. 2007, but if you look at yeah. like, you have to study the history. You have yeah. to study the math. Yeah. I make all my decisions based on history and math. Yep. And most of those people, all those brilliant economists, yes. they don't think the real estate market's going to affect it at all. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it's going to be a little bit, but you know. But, but, it, but again, it's so even, even right now, so we sit in a unique position because we've got you know 7,000 clients that are all over the world, but let's just take the, the, the U.S. group specifically. If you look at the math right now, it's, it's, it's an adjustment that looks something like this. If you're in the upper one third price range anywhere in the world, right? Mm -hmm. That's a little softer right mm -hmm. now, but, but there's micro markets everywhere, right? The, the north of $15 million price range right now in Manhattan mm -hmm. is on fire, mm -hmm. right? The coastal Orange because it's County. Discounted. No, no, it's actually, you're not, seeing, you're not seeing big discounts necessarily, okay. right? Now you will see, here, here's the way it works. What a nice home in the high end comes on the market that's priced relatively close, not not two million dollars worth of padding for what we used to have in terms of appreciation. That's call right. it you know twelve to even sixteen, seventeen. Mm -hmm. If it's priced reasonably close and it's a nice house, it sells really fast. Of course. The problem is right now, if you're studying the MLS or you're studying the hot sheets, what you're seeing is a tremendous amount of properties that the seller's trying to cash out at the highest possible price because the market. Mm -hmm. But they didn't make the price. You know, they didn't make the house nice. They didn't like. Buyers have choices. Right, buyers have choices. If I'm gonna buy a crappy house, I'm not gonna pay a premium price. Of course. But if you show me a beautiful house with a stunning view, with a great floor plan, with you know maybe furniture included, and you price it with a premium, I'm gonna negotiate with you. I'm gonna bid on that property, mm -hmm. right? That's what you're seeing right now. But if you look at the bottom two third pricing, it's completely on fire. On fire. We talked to our clients that are selling $250,000 houses in you know, Destin, Florida, and they're like, Hotcakes. they're like, we keep hearing people talk about this. What are they smoking out there? Like, what are you talking about? Like, we're on fire. We California, see the same thing all over same the country, thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, I get I get super heated on this because there's so many people creating a negative narrative right now. Of course. And and look, like that may work in the stock market. Write a bad article about Zillow or Bank of America or some other company, and you know, if you have influence, maybe mm -hmm. you'll get the stock to adjust and you can short it and make some money. But in the residential real estate world, in the commercial, forget the commercial real estate world. Right. Is that ever going to end? No. Was there even a bad part in 2008, 9, 10? Nope. I mean, it's right. So like people got to really get the facts. And, and that's the part. And you make a great point, Tom. You need to listen to your real estate professional that's educated. And that's where you come into play to keep them educated. Bingo. Because the math and the metrics, how you frame the conversation yeah. with your clients yep. is paramount. Yes. If you talk about, here's what we're gonna do, there's gonna be some kind of correction, it's totally normal, mm -hmm. here's what it looks like. Yep. This is the part that's soft, but here's why. Yep. You give them more information yes. so they can make a quality decision yeah. to list the price at here or there. Yep. Bingo. And then you have the room and the expectations are set. So you're not like, you said I was gonna sell this for six million. Yeah. And we yeah. haven't even got an offer for five. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the agent's fault. That's 100%. the realtor's fault. 100%. Someone made a better sales pitch. Mm -hmm. It was the seller, not the agent. Um, you know, it's interesting too, you think about um, just, just seller expectations, client expectations. It's the same in every business, right? Of course. <laughs> At the end of the day, our job is to be the educator, the person that studies the facts, studies the numbers, and then displays it in a way that says, now, Andy, does this make sense? How can we move forward? Our job is to help. Like, nobody wants to be sold. Nope. Nobody wants to be closed, right? Nope. We want to be informed so we make a good decision, move forward, and feel confident about it. There's a huge gap in the real estate market with exactly what you just said. I know. I think it's because there are people that don't want to invest in the time to get this crucial knowledge because it's been so hot for five, six years, yeah. they list it in sales. Yeah. Why do they have to invest in their yeah. own self-education? What was your marketing plan? I hit enter in the MLS. 12 offers. <laughs> right? I must be really good. I should be a coach. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the greatest. <laughs> I'm gonna create a seminar at an online academy. Yes, yes. It kills me. Yeah. 
Because, but, do you, but do you look at the way the, the real estate, like the industry, like 1.3 million agents, NAR, mm -hmm. and then maybe the other 1 million shadow people that are not a part of NAR, mm -hmm. right? And they, you know, maybe like yourself that they're you know, flipping and they're doing deals. I look at that NAR number of 1.3 million. Let's be clear. That is only there for one reason, lobbying. That's so, all it is. So, Give, get the dues. Let's go lobby. And, and look at Bob Goldberg and, you know, the people that are running NAR. Mm -hmm. I love you. This is not a knock on you, but let's, let's just call it for what it let's is, just right? Be real, right? Right. But then you look at the actual data and it's like half the people don't sell houses, mm -hmm. right? So you really don't have 1.3 million agents. You might have 1.3 million people paying dues and membership fees, and that's great for lobbying. But 600,000 are selling a house. And then when you break that down, there's only 43,000 people in the US that sold more than 25 transactions. That's right. Right? You have to look at the transactional data. For sure. Period the end. For sure. So, so um, I recently partnered with uh, Steve Murray in a company called Real Trends. So they created the uh, America's Best Real Estate Agents, which means you sold more than 50 homes mm -hmm. or you did more than $20 million in sales volumes to qualify to be on that list. That's fair. And then the top 1,000, we then published inside the Wall Street Journal and we ranked them based upon, you know, solo agent or team transactions and volume, right? Mm -hmm. And just straight out of the MLS or straight from their brokers, right? Signed off and, you know, with all that integrity. But here's the deal on the America's Best, there's only 15,000 agents. So only 15, so there's 43,000 that sell 25 or more. There's only 15,000 that either do $20 million or more in volume. Now, remember, that could be one house mm -hmm. in Beverly Hills sure can. or 50 or more transactions. So it's, it's a really interesting time right now in real estate. I could not agree with you more. And it's a fun time. It's Absolutely. a fun time to get really educated. It's yes. a fun time to set a definitive marketing plan, maybe for the first time ever, yeah. that doesn't consist of dropping a pad of paper up on somebody's porch Bingo. when you can literally digitally farm with Facebook ads and targeting like you talk about a lot. Yep. Massive part of my message. If you're not dominating your zip codes yeah. based on that, you're just blowing it. Yeah. Instagram stories, you're using it as a as a daily vlog to let your potential clients know what you do. Yep. Do you know how many deals I've got because I'm a good dad? For because sure. Because I'm home at three o'clock every day and I tell people yeah. like, oh, he's a good guy. As I'm doing what I say I'm doing. Yeah, because you're relatable. <laughs> right. You're real, <laughs> right. right? Well, and that's another big yeah. part that I talked a yeah. lot of our clients about. I'm like, I just went, I just went to your Instagram. Yeah. And I saw perfect kitchen, perfect bathroom, perfect house, perfect door. Ba -ba -da -da -da. Yeah. Yeah, Where are yeah. you? Airbrush, airbrushed photo. Yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah. like, come on. Like, people yeah. need to know this is a personal business. Yeah. It's a transactional yeah. business yeah. based on relationships. Yeah. I don't care if you've sold two deals or 200. They're yeah. going to do business with you as a person. And we're talking, we're not talking just real estate. We're talking agents. Everything. We're talking salespeople. Just any, like, at the end of the day, you know, we, we, like, you look at like the, um, Google did a study a couple of years ago and I was up at like this real estate symposium with them and they're, they're mm -hmm. basically showing us all this data from Google's analytics on what's happening in the it's real the estate best. search game. It's phenomenal. Great relationships and wonderful people and thank them all the time. Mm -hmm. The, the number one thing that people are looking for is trust, right? So that shouldn't shock us, but it's 49% of their decision making processes. Do I trust you? Now the question becomes, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you know if I trust you? If all I'm seeing is a static photo on a website, with no video, no social, nothing but perfect photos. How, how do I get to know you? Your bio, are you kidding me? Like the reviews that you posted on your website, you mean the seven good ones that you put up there? Your homies. Right, exactly. <laughs> thanks mom, thanks dad, right? <laughs> thanks my exactly. assistant. Like, exactly. you know, I think, what was the, there was an infomercial guy a million years ago actually went to jail because of that. Cause all of his testimonials were like, all his bullshit. niece, his nephew, his brother, no right? I mean, yes, way. scumbag, right? So, so the deal is like what you're talking about is how do you create trust? When I started the, my YouTube channel a million years ago, mm -hmm. the goal was like, I'm gonna put out all of my content for free, which mm -hmm. I got, like this is 10-ish, 11 years ago, like competitors and friends and my dad calling mm -hmm. me like, what, what are, you the doing? are you doing? You're giving away the stuff that we all charge 300, 500, 800, 1,000. And I'm like, look, I, I wanna help people. Like, truth. like the industry sucks. Like the more people that know what to do, the better. They're, they're not all gonna watch, they're not all gonna listen. But if I can just help that, that one gal who's a single mom in Indiana list two more houses, sell three more properties, get her financial house. If I can help that person, it's worth it for me to give it all away for free. Well, fast forward 10 years later, you know, millions of views, 240,000 followers, still doing the same exact thing. And at the end of the day, like people know exactly who I am. It's trust. Right, I am reliable for them, right? And, and even if I get on an airplane and I'm flying to some fancy place, like whatever, like some people would say that looks showy, 
And I would say, no, it's like 30 years of working my ass off and I choose not to fly coach, right? Like I have that option now, but they've seen my journey. It wasn't, it wasn't like that 10 years ago. It wasn't like that 20 years ago. It certainly wasn't like that 30 years ago, mm -hmm. right? But people evolve with you, right? You gotta create that trust. So Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, it's all a trust mechanism. It's a strategy of trust. It's the biggest part of the first yeah. meeting that yeah. we usually have. Yeah. We have to establish trust and market. Bingo. And they look at me like, well, everybody trusts me. Nope, no one knows you. No. So is your phone ringing off the hook every single day? You're getting come list me calls or people just trying to bang down your doors to do business with you? That would be trust. Exactly. Yeah. And that you can track with Google Analytics. Bingo. You can track with YouTube Bingo. and Facebook. Yeah. You can tell if people actually trust you based on their action. People vote with their credit cards. 1, people vote percent. with their emails and they call yep. you. People yep. vote when they want to opt into more information with you. Bingo. It's, it's never been... It's never been easier to build trust in market, mm -hmm. but it's still really difficult and takes a lot of time. We have a mutual friend, Gary V, yep. and we we're just talking about this exact same thing off camera. Yep. What, he, what he told me yep. is he put your head down for two years and give everything away for free. Yep. And I was like, everything for free? Smart. I, I knew he was right, mm -hmm. so I did. Yep. It has changed my life dramatically. I'm, You've been I, doing it for 10. I, exactly. Like it's, yeah. it's just the right thing to do. It is. I have, still to this day, I have a lot of investors. They call me, Andy, shut your mouth yeah. about this. You're going to change the way people look at multifamily. Yeah. Like real estate. I'm like, yeah. perfect. Good. That's my goal. Good. I was raised by a single mom. Yeah. Like rented forever. She mm -hmm. was like fourth generation renter. I'm trying to change that culture in this yeah. country. Yeah. It's now a choice. Yeah. I, I work a lot in Cleveland. There are people that a third generation that, that literally live in a duplex, their rent is five fifty a month. Yeah. That duplex is sixty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. They put three point five percent down, three grand. They could buy that duplex. The mortgage is four eighty. Yeah. They could literally live for free. I do little seminars out there and people are in you know tears. Means? Stop eating McDonald's three times a week, go and to Starbucks. the grocery store and and like actually make a meal, you'll save money. You'll get healthier, you'll yeah. be happier, yeah. and you'll change. Just, you'll save money. You'll save money, exactly. Because because the person that's paying, paying $550 a month in rent, $3,000 is like you know $400,000 to you, that's right? right? So it's it's re it's way outside of their identity, Yes. right? So so again, change your identity, change your life, right? So change your beliefs, getting change that, your worth. Getting that person to just say, okay, where do I spend money on stupid stuff? Right now, probably nothing to them is stupid, but if anybody with the right mind sat back sure. and said, okay, you probably don't need to have McDonald's like four times a week. And this, I'm not hating on McDonald's, though I hate McDonald's. Yeah, no, I'm with um, you. You know what I mean? Just, it's just it should be called like, this food's gonna kill it's you. It's gonna kill but, you slowly, yeah. Um, what's, that, what's the great line? <laughs> you dig your grave with your teeth. With your teeth. I love that's that so line. Jeff, uh, Jeff Olson, slight mm -hmm. edge. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I just, that, I think that's inspiring that you're doing that. And I, I applaud you for being two years in. And I don't, I don't know what Gary's final piece of advice is, but I would say, uh, don't stop. Don't stop after two years. Yeah, um, I couldn't stop now if I tried. The, I get so many DMs from people that, I've, that don't like one photo, yeah. that they don't comment on any picture, yeah. they've been following me for a year or yep. two, yep. and they'll send me a huge email or just a DM saying like, you changed my life. Yeah. That is what keeps yeah. me going. Not all the commas and the zeros in the bank. Yep. That, me yeah. being impactful yeah. to that is everything to me. Who's your mentor on parenting? That's a great question. So I look at what my mom and dad did poorly mm -hmm. and have used that as to what not to do, yeah. but I don't really have a, that's the way that I'm going to raise my kids. Yeah. I'm just trying to lead by example yep. and lead by action. Not what I say, but what I do. A big thing for me is is literally being home at three o'clock. Yeah. Three o'clock every day mm -hmm. is massive to my kids. And when my son, who's now five, was three years old, he told my wife that I didn't have a job. Yeah. Why is daddy leaving? He doesn't work. And I'm like, I've won as a father. Yeah. I'm working my face off, have yeah. five companies, and my yeah. son doesn't think I work. Yeah. So for me, I'm trying to do what I didn't have. Yeah. But if you have somebody, I'm always more than willing to. Yeah. No, I was just, I mean, you know, for me, it's, uh, you know, mommy and me groups, mm -hmm. you know, my kids are 19 and 17. So, you mm -hmm. know, three of my closest friends today were in a mommy and me, they're the dads of the mommy and me group. And we, mm -hmm. we talk about it all the time. We still talk about it. Now we're talking about, you know, first year in college and, mm -hmm. you know, a senior in high school, cause we're all kind of in that same situation, but we're always in that dialogue. Like how do we help our kids? What's the right approach? How do you Smart. not coddle them so much? How do you, you, you have to get the, like, they have to suffer. They have to experience pain. And, mm -hmm. when, and when we say this to our wives, God bless their little bobby socks, they're like, no, 
Oh, not no, my babies. Right. I built them. Yeah. Wow. And you know, and then I look at and the you know the one of the guys has you know multi billion dollar hedge fund. The other one uh, buys and sells businesses all the time, right? Um, oh, and the other one is the number one brain surgeon on the West Coast, right? <laughs> so, like, think about that. Like, I, I'd hang I out with him on a Friday night, and I'm like, oh, man, I had a really rough week. How about you? And he's like, yeah, how was your week? And I'm like, oh, man, I had to be in Cincinnati, New York, Miami. And I did this show, and blah, 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 blah. And he's like, yeah, I did, like, 17 brain surgeries. <laughs> like, You're like, you went. I was like, wow, okay, <laughs> suck it up, Barry. But it's true, yeah. and it's, it's a big fear of mine. Yeah. My kids are not being raised in the same environment that I was. Which, so there's which, not that friction point. Yeah. And, like... They live in the nicest neighborhood of Long Beach yep, yeah. that I always wanted to live in they're, when I was a kid. They're screwed. I know. So there's these pain points yeah. that they need to go through. Yeah. I mean, just me looking at my three-year-old, my five-year-old, I'm like, and they're running around our beautiful house that we built. I'm like, you guys have no idea because <laughs> I have yeah. no clue. Yeah. But I love them. But no, look, and we and be clear, like, you know, I would, I, both my kids are spoiled. Yeah. Right. And... So, so going back to your, like, like with no mentor with like what you're saying is like, Hey, I, I try and be home at three o'clock. The thing I would challenge you on is just consider with no strategy, every tactic is a good idea, 100%. right? Mm -hmm. So, so going back to that 20 year vision, mm -hmm. like I have read that for as long as I've been doing 20 year visions, which is now let's mm -hmm. see, my 19, 17. So probably when the boys were two and four, mm -hmm. right. I've been reading it to them. So they, they have this future to live into. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, I'm not saying. Michael and Steven, you're going to be doing this and this only. I'm saying we as a family will be involved in these types of things or something better. And then oh. I see you guys working with mom and I in certain capacities or something better. And you guys will have your own ventures because you're going to need your own outlet to be your own man. Like, and you're all, setting the frame. I'm, you're planting the seeds and you're watering it. I'm late. So then when I say to them at seven and nine, come to my conference, pass out flyers on, on all the chairs, and then sell for, for like, cause we do charity things every time, right? So we've raised, I don't even know, a million dollars plus, plus, plus in charities where we match whatever the, the agents are buying, t-shirts, whatever. Sure. Building an orphanage in Africa, you awesome. know, Breast Cancer Research Foundation, Wounded Warriors, on and on. And they're back there and literally they'll walk up to me with like, you know, $25,000 in cash and hand us the cash, you know, CFO takes it and organizes it and right, does the donation stuff mm -hmm. and they don't get paid a dime. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and like my friends, are, well, you, 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 they're working 14 hours a day. I'm like, well, that's what we do that's when we're we do. doing a seminar, Probably right? Family. Like that, that's what you do. Like uh, I, you I probably guess, did it, right? The hell yes. Right. <laughs> Same exact deal. That's right. <laughs> I mean, if I, if I said to you the number of audio cassette programs that I'm like I stapled that pages, I packed, no, that, that I've packed in ship, put the, you know, the label on yep. and took out to the UPS guy. You know, like it's like I, I don't have audio cassette programs, I think, for that reason. Right. <laughs> it's a terrible just, taste in your mouth. It's just a negative association. <laughs> but I think there's something too, like kids have to suffer. Kids have to experience you're living proof of it. I'm mm -hmm. living like, you know, this crew right here mm -hmm. I'm looking at, like I certainly know my guys real well. Like they yep. they've suffered, mm -hmm. right? And from that, right, you you figure out who you really are. It's the biggest form of growth. Like yeah. there's and this is something I talk about a lot. I don't learn that much from my wins except for that it feels good. Yeah. My growth comes from my suffering, comes from breakdowns. Just all the breakdowns and yep. finding those little chinks in the armor. And I'm like, yeah. oh, that got through. Yeah. I need to yeah. I need to fix that. Yeah. And that's the only way to really grow. If you're always getting high fives, yeah. That's a big problem yeah. too with kids nowadays. I'm like, first, second, and third. That's it. <laughs> it's like, how about first, last? <laughs> I get right. That. Like, that's basically you know, like, it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm I'm all my son's a tennis player. Yeah. There is no better sport uh, to shape one's belief system about hard work, focus, and how precious it is to win mm. than to be a tennis player, mm -hmm. especially in Southern California. And he's you know he's six foot, 170 pounds, serves ball 120 miles an hour, like perfect athlete you know, for tennis. Getting recruited by colleges, but he's not going to play at USC, right? He's not gonna, he's not going to play for like the super insane, you know. So I want to I'm being clear, he's good. Yeah, he's not incredible, right? right? He's not going to go pro. But when I ask him, like, what, like, how do you, how do you go through a year and play in like twenty five tournaments and never win? Like, think that would about kill that's, me. that's tennis. That would kill right? me. That's tennis. It's not like yeah. soccer. We're all yeah. in this team thing together. And yeah. well, it's, a, it's a single sport. It is. Yeah. It, you live and die mm -hmm. on the court by yourself in your head, mm -hmm. right? And and you know what? Like, it has made him such an extraordinary young man to to be able to live in losing all the time always striving to be better, mm -hmm. it, it's the greatest gift ever. It's 
it's going to do so much for him yeah. like moving forward Bingo. he's going to owe a ton to it Bingo. it's like um and when i was talking to um by the way i'm totally anti football baseball soccer everybody wins yeah. i hate the school system i think i i love educators but i think the entire school, school system is just an absolute abomination that is a perfect transition to what i wanted to bring up again was you were in the car, I think it was on like your last vlog or something. I was with, with awesome. Money right over there. I'm yeah, telling yeah. you, like yeah. that vlog was fire, by the way. Yeah. And because you were so into your passion of what you believe yes. in. I'm the same way. Yeah. I went to school for like a year. It was like a junior college class to be a fireman. And yeah. then I went yeah. in a totally different direction. I was gonna become like the youngest wine sommelier in the country at 21. I've gone different ways. Yeah. It's broken. My wife is the opposite. She's like, you have to go to this and her master's program, da, da, da. Yeah. I'm like, but it's not for everybody. No. And it's broken. No. And you said something that was so profound. It was to have somebody go to college without some kind of direction and purpose, purpose. should be illegal. Yeah. Like, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Or just See, go for a year. If the only purpose is to be $100,000 in debt, <laughs> you're right. a dumbass. Agreed. And you're Sorry, taking, Tristan, I'm not just totally razzing you, but you know what I mean? Like we have that conversation, well, just keeping it real. Like, Well, yeah, and yeah. that debt can put you in a really negative position for years. And then you have student debt, yes. you have a leased car, you have rent and you have credit card yeah. debt. Now you have to yeah. work. Yeah. So by the way, how do you feel about all the people that say, college should be free? I would want to assassinate them. Yeah. It's, the, it's the worst, that's the worst yeah. answer. Yeah. Everything that leads up to that is bad, that's the worst. Yeah. Free? Yeah. If you're not investing in yourself like I am every day yeah. and investing in real estate to build my legacy, if you don't have skin in the game, there's a very different feeling inside of you. Yeah. But Andy, like I, I'm not <laughs> like you. I haven't figured out who I am. And so I'm gonna go to college for seven years and party like a rock star and No, you're gonna go intern for free for two yeah. straight years like, and find join, out what you like. Join the military. Yeah, do that. Peace Corps. Do something. Do something. Travel. Go travel Europe. Like bring a, a camera and a backpack. That's what I yeah. did. Yeah. And then it's just like you you have to taste a lot yeah. when you're young. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to just be super ambitious and did a lot of different yeah. stuff. Yeah. I found out what I was really good at. Yeah. And then I keep reinventing myself yeah. to learn new stuff. Yeah. Don't you think books, so first of all, just to clarify for the person that like is just like, screw up very good. Yeah. You know, I'm a teacher, right? Like, yeah. Uh, listen, I love all my teachers. I am a teacher. You too. My whole point is if you're going to go to college, look, if you want to be a, if you're going to go get a trade, like, I want to become a lawyer. I want to become a doctor. I want to be a pilot. Like if it's a trade, then you go to the appropriate school and you get your trade, right? And then there's a but fair But make sure exchange. it's because what you want to do and not mom and dad. 1000%, right? That's a whole other conversation. Totally. We just defer that all to Gary Vee and let him just go, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, go exactly. for days on it. So I want to be clear, like, like if I was reinventing the education system, there would be trade schools everywhere in America, yes. right? Everyone would be required to read things like Strength Finders, get their disc profile. Let's try and find what is your most natural DNA Right, because like if you want to be a ballerina or a dancer, awesome, right? But if like, you suck, well, yes, like right. There's that too, but like you, then go do that, right? But like, are you going to go spend like seventy, ninety thousand dollars a year to go to Juilliard and like, like that just feels, it feels irresponsible. It, you took the words we, out of my mouth. We've got twenty-one trillion dollars in debt as a country for a reason. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of shit there's that's a, being propagated here. There's a lot of student debt. Yep. There's a stock market that's kind of full of. A little bit of ice cream, a little bit of bubble gum. Yep. People are talking trash about the real estate market. Yeah. What I talked, it was it was one of my first YouTube videos two years ago. I said, I think for the first time, mm -hmm. we're in a little bit of an issue with real estate. We're in a massive, massive problem with student debt. Yep. And we have a stock market that's being fluffed up. This could be really bad. Don't know if that's actually gonna happen or not, but I was talking about it because yeah. it's the way I felt. Yeah. Because there's so many people, so many millennials that I talked to that are like, I, I hate what I went to school for. Yeah. It's yeah. such a common, yeah. common conversation. Yeah, yeah. Or, or like Tristan over here, mm -hmm. who's, you know, an insane videographer would, would said, I went to college and the first two years I was just doing what I had to do because it was what I thought I wanted to do. And then I found my passion mm -hmm. and then finished strong. And now he's in his passion. Like, so, so there's gotta be like, wouldn't it be cool if there was uh, just like, and that's why I go back to string finders and discs, like something, and I'm not attached to either one of those, what? some way to identify with what are you passionate about? But here's the thing, go back to that kid who's four years old or in, in the fourth grade mm -hmm. who finds themselves in a fixed mindset. Well, they get passionate about nothing. Nothing. Right? So, so video games are a great outlet, you know, party and whatever. Wait, you may be reading the library and never talking to anybody. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. My, my whole point is we have a societal issue 
right? It is so clear. Like, and I get like the the hardcore people, you know, the one percenters. We should uh, get them, right? right? And like, you know, like you spend more. Go to Israel. Mm -hmm. Go talk to fifty owners of companies in Israel about how they feel about the the Palestinians, and they all like go like this. Eh, I'm friends with all of them, right? What they say is. It's the radical 1% on this side and the radical 1% on our side that create all the noise and that's what makes the news. That's right. Right now, I'm not saying that there aren't things that are happening no. in, that, in that region of the world. I'm, right. I'm mindful, like I've sure. been there many times, like I understand it, sure. but it's that radical 1% on both sides. So, you know, maybe we're being a little radical on one side. True, and I completely agree, but there's, there's enough data yeah. to speak to this point. No is like, is it, it needs to be fixed. Yeah. And there's so many creatives out there that are being told they should do something else. Yeah. And it's really taking 10 years off of their growth as an entrepreneur, or they're starting it when they're 30, and now they don't have the same kind of, there's, anyways. Okay, totally random. You're mm -hmm. a sommelier. Mm -hmm. Do you still drink? No. Mm -hmm. So you don't drink at all? I, I drink a little bit okay. here and there, but yeah, yeah. for me. Not the way you did when you were a sommelier. No, so, so I was gonna be a fireman. Like mm -hmm. that's what I was gonna do my whole entire life. Mm -hmm. I was working at Walt's Wharf in Seal Beach. Walt was on my first mentor, an amazing human being, and he told me to always buy the land or buy the dirt. So yeah. there's a whole awesome story behind that. But I loved that man and trusted him and believed in him. His son was a winemaker. Mm -hmm. He came to the restaurant where I was, I was waiting tables. Mm -hmm. I knew there was white wine, red wine, and pink wine. Yeah. Knew nothing. He was talking so passionately about wine and how it's made and like the smells and the sipping. Like I fell in love. Six weeks later, I'm in Bordeaux trying to learn how to become the youngest sommelier in like the country. I want yeah. to be one of three that passed the exam at 21. Yeah. So it changed my whole entire trajectory of my life. Fell in love, wanted to know everything about it. And when I was 30, I was like, I'm drinking too much. Yeah. So I slowed down, yeah. stopped for like four years, started back up again. And well, became, a, became an athlete, right? Totally. Reset so, your health and vitality, change your identity. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally changed my identity from I'm the wine guy yeah. to I'm this healthy athlete that's invested in real estate. Yeah. Told myself a different conversation. And you know, now I'll have wine like every once in a while. It was my whole world. Yeah. But because there was a pain point that I let myself start to abuse it a little bit. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just the wine. I'm like, yeah. I'm trying to fill a hole here. I need to hit pause. Yeah. But I'm self-aware enough to know that'll become a problem. Okay, there's a killer book. Mm -hmm. uh, I just ordered it by the recommendation of a friend of mine who mm -hmm. is uh, admittedly a raging alcoholic and now has <laughs> not had any alcohol uh, in the last year and a half. And uh -huh. it's completely changed his life. Yeah. Um, but I got to find, it was one of the hot books on um, on Apple, mm. right? That, you know, when they sent out the, you know, here's the top, you know, whatever, 10 sure. books being downloaded on uh, iTunes or whatever it is. I'll find it. And, but it's basically, yeah, it's, it's, about, it's basically about getting control of your alcohol. It's right? so important. If you want to work out in the morning yeah. and you just drank a bottle of wine because you had a stressful day, mm -hmm. you're going to work out at 50%. Yep. Yeah. Most people Easy. do or exactly that. That's if you work out. If you work out <laughs> yeah. or you yeah. punt it and yeah. you're worried about, and now you don't, now you don't want to do Facebook Live because your face is bloated or puffy, and yeah. now you're not. It just it's this. And listen, everybody has their stuff. Yeah. You want to drink? Cool. I'm an investor, by the way, in two alcohol companies. So I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, no, I'm dogging. I'm just. I, you know, I'm just, I, just, I was. I curious. own a bar in Long yeah. Beach. Okay, got it. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I get it. Yeah. But it's this. It's one of those things where it's all for me. It's it was slowing me down. Yeah. I just turned 42, yeah. and I'm like, damn, you're old. I'm so. No, I'm, I'm literally just <laughs> crushed. And what's and what's funny is, man, I literally feel like I'm barely even starting. Like yeah. just get getting that. just getting rolling. Yeah. So, so transition and talk to us about, uh, you wrote this book, 100 Doors. Mm -hmm. So for the people that maybe haven't read it, they should get the book, mm -hmm. right? Is there an audio version of it also? Not yet, but it's coming. Okay, cool. So, so what, is, what was the sort of uh, inspiration for the 100 Doors? A massive part was my mom. So my mom was third generation renter. I did not know that you could put 3.5% down and buy a four unit building. Yeah. I was in a huge board meeting with all these lenders and mortgage brokers and I was pretty green in real estate. And this one lender, he gets up and he starts talking about 3.5% FHA financing on these three and four unit buildings. And I literally stood up and stopped the whole meeting. Does that loan product still exist today? Yep. Yeah. It is one of- I just want to be clear, like people were like, this This wasn't just 2011, 12. No, it's been yeah. around forever. Yeah. And there's also stuff with VA. And like, isn't that, is it owner occupied? You have to owner occupy. Yeah. It used to be two years, now it's only one. Yeah. If you're not educating your clients on this space, you're leaving a massive amount of money on the Talking table. about like like working with a millennial who's thinking about buying their first place and you're like, look. Like, like I mean, one of my closest friends in high school, sadly got hit on his moped 
And the parents were smart enough to take the money, right? The $500,000 he got and bought him a duplex on PCH in Newport in 1989. Love that story. Uh, I'm like, so Mike, where you been? He's like, I'm still traveling the world surfing. He's That's 48, he's never had a job. He that just probably sounds familiar to Kyle. His rent. It's fantastic. He got hit by a car. He's got a nice little, like, you know, huge chunk of cash and we're gonna buy him a four unit building. Like. <laughs> Do not buy dumb shit. <laughs> Okay, oh, that's just my advice to all people. Stop buying dumb shit. So I have a massive message to all the millennials out yeah. there. For one, it's a very easy read. It's called The 100 Doors. It's yep. only 100 pages. It's free on my website. Yeah. You can download it in whatever language you want to read it. Love it. It's so easy to read it. It literally will take you half Andy a day. AndyDaneCarter.com. AndyDaneCarter.com. Get the free book. It's an awesome book. But what's cool is my mom was always a renter. Yeah. She didn't understand that if she saved and she could have bought the duplex that we were living in when I was a kid for like a hundred grand. Yeah. They're 800 now. Yep. Her retirement would have looked very different. So have for, you seen that stat by the way? Yeah. So the, you know, if somebody buys a house versus doesn't buy a house, mm -hmm. their net worth is $6,000. If they buy a house, it's $300,000, yep. right? No house, house. So love it. So, so the origin was your mom, but what's the concept of the book? What, what's the message you're trying to get across inside this hundred doors? Is that you can build generational wealth. You can become an investor. If you're a real estate agent, you need to start thinking like an investor because sometimes you get the deals before anybody else. So you have a yeah. huge advantage. Yep. But for me, it's this passive cash flow income. And you can do it anywhere in the country, but it's building up a hundred doors where they're cash flowing roughly a thousand dollars a door. So you're making a hundred yeah. grand a month in passive income. So Andy, everybody says the same thing, right? And it's not a hundred grand net, right? It's no. minus your costs and expenses Everything, yes. and right. So just want to be clear. Um, but a lot of people will say, and, and you know, I coach these wildly successful agents that, that are generating, you know, 200,000 to 20 million, right? I mean, it's just unbelievable how much revenue that they can create. Actually, no, one big team making the 20, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, still, you're talking about gobs and gobs and gobs of income, and they say the same thing over and over again. Yeah, but I can't buy in my area because it's too expensive. Bullshit. Well, first of all, so, so tell me more. What, okay. what do you say to that person? I say, you're wrong. That's a story that's in your head. And let's yeah. get to the truth. Yeah. And I'll usually pull up the MLS right in their face yeah. and find underperforming tons of assets that the rents are too low. Yep. The price is way too high. Mm -hmm. And I go and I contact the seller. Yeah. If it's listed, I go and contact the real estate professional. We start talking. Yeah. I like buys where the rents are grossly low. I also like ones that it might be the second generation or third generation that's looking to cash out. Yeah. There's so many little tips and tricks and hacks if you're willing to put in the work to get the data. Do you have a buy box that you recommend? As far as? Like, you know, you, you know, like, all these companies that I'm talking to that are out raising hundreds of millions of dollars because they want to go buy real estate, you know, direct from consumers mm -hmm. as the broker, right? So they've got a buy box. We mm -hmm. buy three bedroom, two bath, this square foot that would rent for this much that I can fix or flip for $15,000 as an example. Like that's their buy box. Yes. When you're buying multi-unit and it sounds like you're not buying like hundred plexes, you're buying duplexes and fourplexes. And, and, is that correct? Yeah. Actually we go as high as 30 units. Okay. But that's just because that's where we're comfortable. Yeah, like the I get math it. is the same. Yeah, I get it. I get it. So, so what's the buy box for you? For us, it's we like at least two bedrooms, one bath. Mm -hmm. We like some kind of value add. Yeah. The so value, no, no single like you know lofts. You know, buying eight buy plex with like a we bunch of townhouses. one bedrooms, right? No. Yeah. There's there's some some that we do mm -hmm. if they're huge. So the yeah. square footage is massive. Yeah. We can chop a two bedroom into a three bedroom because we're going to. Like there's so many awesome old school buildings that you can take the dining room yeah. and you convert them as long as you have parking in certain cities. Yeah. We like the value at play yeah. because it's not that expensive to get a lot of money out. What a lot of people don't understand is this cool thing called the gross rent multiplier. Yeah. Look that up on YouTube. Yeah. When you understand that for every certain amount that you raise the rents, you have just appreciated that asset yep. and then the bank will give you back your cash once you hit a certain metrics. Yes. So we look at that first and foremost. These rents are grossly low. We're gonna go in there, we're gonna raise all the rents, we're still gonna keep the rents below market, and then we're gonna get all of our cash back in 12 months to 24 months tops. Yeah. When you do that well over and over again, and your cash on cash investments are getting pulled back out to reinvest somewhere else, it's the best. Yes. And it's possible, but you have to start telling yourself a different story. I can't buy in my zip code is just not true. Yeah. I buy stuff in the hottest market where the cap rates are 1.9 and I'll still find a deal. Yeah. 
They're there. It's, it's again, you know, the, the same methodology for me investing in companies. You look mm -hmm. at like 30, 40 deals and maybe you pick one. You're mm -hmm. looking at maybe a hundred, right. right? Or hundreds mm -hmm. to find the one. And I think that's an important distinction maybe for the, there's so many people that are listening to this that are clients of ours that are the most sophisticated residential real estate agents on the planet. They mm -hmm. know their market, they know the trends, they know the data, like they are just, they're the true professionals. And many of them, when you start talking about real estate investing, they go, like they just- Nothing. They, because they have applied themselves mm -hmm. so, so with all of their heart and all their might here, and they just haven't applied themselves here. And the, the advice that I always give them is read. Go to YouTube, study, watch. Like, don't get stuck in this. Don't, don't be that agent that finds a smoking hot deal and says, I'm gonna put this in the MLS and it's gonna sell for two seconds. No, it's a smoking hot deal. Buy it or flip it to somebody else, get it under contract and sell it to somebody else and make a margin. Berkshire Hathaway has a program for their in-house agents. Yes. That's awesome and I yep. love Warren. Yep. They'll give you- My a buddy, by the way, my personal client was named CEO of the whole thing today. Ron Peltier became oh, awesome. executive chairman and big shout out to Gino Bafari, who's my like 21 year personal coaching client. It's now CEO of the whole thing. Love yeah. that company. Sorry. No, it's, but it's, that's great because that speaks to their investing in their talent. Correct. Which is awesome. And I like how they're so agent friendly with certain things like, we're going to give you the tools to do your first flip if you yeah. want yep. or buy your first investment yep. property. That is so empowering. What a lot of people do in the luxury real estate space, they just put their head down for that. Yeah. What most people do that are selling homes that are five, 10, 20 million, most of the people that own those homes might have a commercial property or two, yeah. might have some multifamily. Oh yeah. You might be able to sell them a couple million in just that every year if you're that guy or gal. Bingo. Bingo, bingo. It's all about being informed, right? That's At the end of the it. day, it like, and I, and I, I want to make sure my clients that are listening know, like, like I know how hard they worked mm. to become the men and women that they are and so respected and so revered in their marketplace. And I'm asking them just to consider, I know some agents that were wildly successful, but not with their money, right? And that this is just a vehicle. Like when you talk about the hundred doors, to me, I just think of stable, steady, remove the stress. Like we talk about like municipal bonds, like mm -hmm. buying stuff that is just 4% you know, return, just safe, easy. A duplex, a fourplex, an eightplex is that same kind of safe returns for decades, right? Put it in your kids. family trust and give it to your kids. There's an awesome story that I that I love. It's, it's my friend's dad, he's a plumber. Never made more than $40,000 in a year ever. Yeah. He bought a duplex in Long Beach and he bought his house. Yeah. He exchanged the duplex twice into a four and then into an eight and just retired at 56, yep. sold everything, made $3 million off of his equity of both, just two properties, yeah. yep. bought a $400,000 beautiful place in upstate New York, yep. 46 acres, has the rest invest in those bonds. He's getting mm -hmm. kicked off four and 6%. Yeah. No state taxes, no yep. federal taxes. He's crushing it. Yeah. And he bought two pieces of real estate in his whole entire life as a plumber. Yeah. He knew the importance of owning dirt and buildings yeah. and stuff because you can't work. Like there's only so much you can do in a day. Yeah. But when your assets start grossly performing for you, that's what, when it gets fun. The only reason why if you're a real estate professional and you're listening to this is fear. You're, you're not yep. doing this out of fear. When you have a high end client or a first time home buyer and you just have the conversation of what's the difference between buying a home, buying a condo and buying a duplex and what are the pros and cons? You are now the expert. Bingo. It's like, it's like six years ago in the world of social media, the guy or gal that knew one more thing than everybody That's else right. was a social media guru, genius. right? So, so wrapping up this, uh, this interview and thank you, you know, for sharing so Thanks much. For What's the one piece of advice you would give to uh, the agent, the entrepreneur, the, you know, the mortgage, the loan officer could be an insurance agent. Listen sure. to this right now. What's the one piece of advice to get started? You have to educate yourself. No one's going to educate you you have to go out and practice this stuff. Yeah. You can't read about push -ups. Don't outsource it. Don't outsource yeah. this yeah. part. Yeah. You need to understand it. You need to look up on mm -hmm. YouTube what a gross rent multiplier is. What's yep. a cap rate? Yep. Why is it important? Yep. And if you feel grossly overwhelmed, good. Yeah. Take a breath. Stay in a growth mindset. Stay in the process mm -hmm. and just learn more. You're going to get better. Yeah. Every athlete was awful in the beginning. Every Every real estate professional was terrible when they started. Yep. Look at where you're at now. Yeah. Give yourself permission to grow. Yeah. Give yourself permission to do whatever you want. But the multifamily real estate space isn't going anywhere in this no. country. No, 49% of all Americans rent. 
Like that space is never going away. Ever. Yeah. Like as long I'm as we need to put a huge dent into yeah. it. As long as yeah. we need shelter, right? That's as right. Long, That's yeah. what I told. You. I yeah. will always invest in real estate as long as people want to live inside. Yeah. I love that line. <laughs> let's let's end on that. Andy Dade Carter. Uh, they should follow you on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. They should absolutely go to your website, download your book. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for your contribution and just being the person you are. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super easy to find. It's just my name, Andy Dane Carter, across all platforms. Love it, man. Thanks, Thanks brother. Man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Hey, it's Tom again. So before I let you go, a couple last things. Hundreds of thousands of others around the world to do it. Now I have the opportunity of at least introducing it to you. If you want more information about this episode, including my show notes, mentions, links, and everything else, make sure you visit tomferry.com slash podcast. That's tomferry.com slash podcast. Thanks again and talk to you soon.